Greetings and a warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ratan Tipineni, and on behalf of all my colleagues at Taigera, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you from around the world. We're very, really excited about today's summit. Uh, our team's been hard at work over the last several months to go find speakers who've been at the forefront of implementing Kubernetes uh, and Kubernetes security and observability so that we could bring you some of the best speakers and thought leaders in the space with the hope that we, they can share their lessons learned with the rest of us in the community. So with that, let me, let me start by introducing you to Taigera and telling you a little bit about who we are. So we are the leaders in Kubernetes security and observability, and uh, we are the inventors, maintainers of Project Calico. Uh, Project Calico is the most adopted open source Kubernetes networking and security solution. We power at least a million nodes uh, across 166 countries uh, around the planet. Uh, we provide a full stack security and observability solution for Kubernetes through our two commercial products. Uh, the first one is Calico Cloud, which is a SaaS offer. And the second one is Calico Enterprise. We, we support multiple data planes, starting with eBPF, standard Linux and Windows, so that our customers have a choice of picking the right data plane for the right use case. And more importantly, we support an architecture of a pluggable data plane because our belief is that the next great data plane is around the corner and we want to give you the choice to be able to pick any data plane either now or in the future and also future-proof any investment that you're making in Calico. Uh, we, we support Envoy as part of a solution. We've been one of the early adopters of Envoy for almost four or five years now. And then our customer list, <clears throat> we've been mostly focused in the last couple of years on Fortune 500 companies. And very proud to say that we've earned the, we've earned the trust of a lot of large companies, especially in the financial services industry, who've been at the forefront of implementing Kubernetes, including JPMC, Morgan Stanley, Visa, Discover, Bloomberg, uh, and service, provi service providers like AT&T and others. Uh, we are very, very widely adopted in the Kubernetes uh, space. Uh, we're also excited with the fact that a lot of other companies in the Kubernetes ecosystem, the Kubernetes distros, uh, uh, the public clouds providing managed Kubernetes services have chosen Calico and have made it the default solution. In a lot of instances, it comes baked in, batteries included as part of their own solution. We have a lot of attendees today from around the world. We, we have people from 84 countries spread across 35 industries. And once again, you know, we, I want to welcome everyone from around the world. We have people from different time zones who are dialing in. Uh, just, just in case you're interested, we are, we, here's the split. We have about 44% uh, from North America, from Americas, I should say. And uh, the rest are yeah, split across EMEA and JPAC, equally at about slightly north of 27% each. I also want to thank all our sponsors, AWS, Suze, Mirantis, and Fortinet. We appreciate uh, your sponsorship. Okay, so if you, look, if you look at the industry trend, starting with containers, and then I'll talk a little bit about Kubernetes. Over the last six years, we have seen a steady growth in the adoption of containers. Uh, we are at a point right now, if you look at this bar chart in terms of production, which is the ultimate heuristic in terms of our technology adoption, we now see about 92% uh, of the, of the uh, uh, companies polled in this survey uh, have now uh, containers in production. 
And of this, a staggering 91% are using Kubernetes for their orchestrator. You could argue that maybe four or five years back, the field was wide open in terms of who would win the race for container orchestration. But it's pretty clear right now that a winner has emerged and it is Kubernetes. And every enterprise I've talked to is now very rapidly standardizing on Kubernetes. Uh, now, Kubernetes does not come without its own challenges. So you know, here's an interesting survey when polled on the different challenges that adopters are seeing. The top three that have jumped out is the first one, which I consistently hear from all our customers, is the lack of internal experience and expertise. Uh, companies are having to reskill uh, and really educate and retrain their teams around Kubernetes because it's a fundamentally different technology. And so they continue to struggle with that. And you, you notice between the last year, while this issues, uh, issue is slightly better, has been mitigated a little bit, but not by much, uh, this continues to be the biggest challenge. And the second challenge is that our meeting security and compliance requirements, because once again, this is uh, very different in the world of Kubernetes and companies are having to figure out that they need a completely different tool set to be able to mitigate threats around Kubernetes. Uh, it's also difficult to integrate with the current infrastructure. Uh, and uh, once again, to state the obvious, uh, the Kubernetes workloads have to coexist with the existing legacy workloads, uh, which means it is not only the integration with the workloads, but also with the existing infrastructure. And the ability for some of the new Kubernetes tooling to be able to integrate with like uh, the current infrastructure is a critical success factor. And uh, that is a non-trivial problem that customers continue to struggle with. So those are the three that jump out as the three biggest uh, barriers to Kubernetes adoption and some of the friction that, that we're seeing inside enterprises. So it'll help to uh, level set a little bit in terms of the cloud native architecture challenges that are getting introduced. So on the left side, you see hosts or VMs uh, running inside the cloud. And given that these workloads are relatively static and long-lived, uh, uh, a traditional Borton perimeter-based security is adequate. It gets the job done. And you could say the same thing about monitoring, any tool that, monitoring, monitoring tool that was designed over the last uh, decade or so is good enough. It, it can get the job done. I think the challenge shows up on the right side when you start to introduce containers uh, and uh, microservices. Uh, given the nature, given that these are very dynamic without any fixed IP addresses, uh, the traditional perimeter-based security model is no longer adequate. You need a fundamentally different architecture for security, which we'll hopefully talk about throughout the day as you, you hear from different experts of how they've dealt with this challenge. And from a monitoring and observability it's interesting when you step back and think about it, you now have a distributed application formed of multiple microservices running on distributed hardware that is being orchestrated by a very powerful distributed operating system like Kubernetes. And nothing short of a purpose-built observability solution will really get the job done. Now here's a typical architecture that we see in, in across our customer base. Here you have uh, a company running uh, Kubernetes workloads inside AWS. And you see these microservices, one of them is making uh, a call and trying to connect to a SaaS application like Salesforce, or perhaps it's trying to talk to an API like Twilio or it's trying to talk to a database, a customer database sitting on Oracle on-prem, which happens to be sitting behind a firewall here. Uh, or it's also trying to talk to uh, an application sitting in a different public cloud. So this is a fairly generic and a typical architecture that we see. 
And we see customers running into four specific security challenges in this architecture. The first one is the lack of granular ingress or egress access control. So when this microservice is trying to reach Salesforce and you open up a port to do that, it turns out anything sitting inside this Kubernetes cluster then has access to Salesforce or in general to any external resource. And that is very problematic. Uh, the second thing is the lack of east-west controls uh, that you can use to prevent lateral movement inside the cluster. Anytime you have an internet-facing application or a microservice inside the cluster, uh, you have to assume the possibility that that microservice could get compromised, in which case, you have to be able to limit the blast radius of that compromise by segmenting those workloads and preventing the compromised workloads from laterally attacking the remaining workloads inside the Kubernetes cluster. The third challenge we see customers running into, like in this case, is their inability for, to integrate and interface with firewalls and SIMs, given that firewalls are looking for static IP addresses so that they can construct their rules. And with Kubernetes, given the dynamic nature of the workloads and IP addresses, integration and interfaces are hugely problematic. Uh, and the last challenge is that you know, you you will have compromises and threats, but there's no easy way to detect these inside the cluster. And trying to hairpin all traffic inside a cluster through an external firewall is at best inelegant, is, is at best an inelegant architecture and inefficient. On the observability side, you have a lot of data that's being created in silos at the application level, networking level, the platform level. Uh, but then the burden falls on the platform engineer to stitch all this data together in the context of a service, which is very problematic. Uh, and the second is there's a high volume of data that is getting spread out in the form of alerts, logs, and traces. I mean, gone are the days when you could brag about how much data you're spitting out. The challenge has now moved to how do you make sense of this data? Because it, cognitively, it's impossible to analyze and synthesize all this data and find out patterns and tease out uh, you know, any kind of anomalies in this data to figure out where perhaps an attack is or perhaps why your application isn't working. And, and you need some level of automation to be able to do that. And the third, third challenge is interesting. Kubernetes abstractions is very powerful. That's really what makes Kubernetes so powerful. It, it simplifies our deployment of applications because you get to define in a high level language how we want the system to behave. And you can then let the system go figure out how to take care of the implementation details. That's, that's, that's why Kubernetes is so beautiful. It's so elegantly designed. However, when things break, when software doesn't work, uh, which unfortunately happens to be in a lot of situations and you do need to debug, the very abstraction that helped you that can, can actually be a blocker to prevent you from debugging these applications effectively. So you need a tool to be able to peel the onion systematically to get to the root cause of an issue. And once again, nothing short of a purpose-built solution for observability for Kubernetes uh, can get the job done. So th these are the challenges we hear from our customers consistently. This is what they struggle with in terms of securing the workloads. And if, if you know, once they're deployed in production, uh, to be able to debug these applications, or more importantly, to empower their developers to debug these applications. You know, these are the three challenges uh, that they struggle with. And our hope is, as we get through the rest of the day, you'll you'll hear a rich set of learnings from our speakers in helping you uh, figure out some best practices to be able to solve these problems. So over the last few months, our team's been very hard at work to go find the right speakers and the right experts uh, to put together this summit so that 
uh, we could bring in people who've been on the front lines who've actually gone out and deployed uh, applications on Kubernetes so that they can share their learnings and also best practices. So we have Morgan Stanley, PayPal, City, Ernest & Young, Mediga, uh, Discover Financial Services, Box. We have a very exciting lineup of speakers from these companies, from these thought leaders to, to, to share with you learnings and also best practices. So let me walk you through the agenda. We have a very exciting agenda. We, our team spent quite a bit of time designing the agenda. Uh, so first, we're going to kick off the day right after this with the main session. We have three very exciting sessions to kick off the day. The first one's going to be kicked, out, kicked off by Graham Hay, who's a distinguished engineer at Morgan Stanley, who I've been fortunate, I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to work with Graham over the last few years. Uh, greatly enjoyed working with him, partnering with him. I've learned a lot in conversing with him. Uh, he's done a fantastic job in architecting Morgan Stanley's next generation solution. And he's gonna share some, some, of, some of what he's done and some of the best practices and some of the motivations behind, uh, behind wh why they did and why they chose this path. Uh, then we'll have Dr. Alex Shulman, uh, who used to be at City, uh, moderate a panel uh, from, with uh, actually City and Mediga and also Taigeta, talk about cybersecurity challenges in Kubernetes environments and give you a very holistic view of how to think about security in the context of Kubernetes uh, that in a way is vendor neutral because sometimes when you hear these pitches from vendors, uh, they tend to be self-serving. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to bring in someone like Dr. Alex Shulman who could give you a fairly neutral assessment of how to think about security. Uh, and then we have a fantastic session that uh, Keith Nielsen is going to run. Uh, he's leading the Kubernetes initiative at Discover Financial Services. He's been architecting and leading that for the last two years. He'll talk about securing Kubernetes workloads at Discover Financial Services. So three very, very exciting sessions uh, by three very accomplished uh, people. And we're super excited to be bringing you the, these sessions. After that, we're gonna split into three different tracks. And here's where you're gonna have a challenge. You're gonna to have to choose uh, which track you want to attend. And that may be a non-trivial challenge because the odds are high that you may want to attend more than one track at the same time. So I got some good news for you. So pick whatever session you want to attend and the sessions you may have missed, we will send you the recordings and you can watch those offline. Uh, so the three sessions, the way they're structured is uh, the first track is stories from the real world. Uh, so these are practitioners who actually led initiatives and projects to deploy, secure, and implement observability for Kubernetes in, 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 the, in, in the real world environment. And we wanted to bring you this track so that you could hear some of the practical challenges they encountered and how they went about solving that with the hope that you, you know, you'll have some powerful takeaways from the lessons learned there. Uh, the second track is around best practices. These are just qualified best practices that you probably want to embrace as you move forward. And, and the third is if you're curious about what's under the hood, you want to get slightly, uh, get a little bit more of a technical preview in terms of how this stuff is happening or built, uh, that would be the right track for you. So just to give you a quick uh, preview of some of the speakers. So I'm starting with the left side stories from the real world. Uh, we'll first have Stanley Pay from PayPal and Manish Sampath from Taigera. We'll, we'll do a fireside chat. And Stanley is gonna talk about the crossroads of security and observability in Kubernetes. Uh, at the second session, uh, Box is one of the pioneers in Kubernetes. And we'll have Rod Singh speak about Kubernetes observability and troubleshooting and some of the best practices that he's built after having a struggle with some of these challenges over the last few years. 
And then we'll have Sheetal Joshi from Amazon talk about service mesh, observability, and what's ahead. And then finally, Amit uh, will uh, moderate, uh, will actually host Saikat Mighty from Salesforce. And uh, he'll talk about ensuring adequate security, observability, and compliance for microservices driven cloud native applications at Salesforce. So that's the first track. On the second track, in terms of best practices, Garward Pang, who's a threat uh, research analyst at uh, Tigera, will talk about intrusion detection techniques in cloud native environments. And then Jeremy Cohen from Amazon will talk about observations from the field in terms of best practices for securing your Kubernetes cluster and clusters and how to build defense in depth. And then uh, we'll have Mikhail Shapiro and Carmen Pukio uh, speak about building secure and observable Kubernetes platforms for scaled software delivery and certainly Amazon's a company that knows scale. Uh, and then finally, we'll have Brian Langston from Mirantis talk about upgrading DevSecOps with compliance automation. All right, and so on the last track, another herd. Over the last couple of years, we've been working with a fantastic group of engineers uh, headed by Jeremy Tollett at Cisco Systems. Uh, and we worked with them to integrate uh, uh, Calico with PPP, there's a, another data plane. And Jeremy will talk about unlocking performance and innovation for large scale Kubernetes clusters and how VPP may be a data plane you may want to choose for that. And we have our own very Sean, own Sean Crampton, who's our distinguished engineer at Tigera, talk about uh, eBPF, and he has been the main architect for our eBPF uh, data plane. And then Manoj Ahuja, Ahuja from uh, Tigera will talk about threat targeting uh, in Kubernetes and defenses you can deploy. And finally, our developer advocate, Chris Tompkins will talk about the importance of multiple data planes and more importantly, the importance of having a pluggable data plane architecture. So there you go. You get, we've got a really rich agenda and a fantastic lineup of speakers today. Can't wait to hear all of them. I'm also very excited to be announcing and launching the, a new Calico certification specifically for AWS developers. Uh, so this is a self-service self certification program, uh, and uh, you can gain expertise in Kubernetes networking and security. Uh, and you will build the confidence you need to deploy Kubernetes on both AWS and EKS uh, with confidence and gives you the opportunity to, to learn and to, and to up-level your skills. So check it out, we just announced it today and we just uh, launched it today. Very excited about this. All right, with that, so we'd love for you to connect with us. So first feel free to tweet, post about this event live as you go through this. Uh, please use the handle Tigera Cube Summit if you do decide to tweet or post. Uh, do follow us, we're very active on various social media. We're at, at Project Calico at Tiger.io on Twitter. And our LinkedIn uh, uh, is Tiger is our handle. We're very active on LinkedIn also. And don't forget to visit our sponsor booths today. So with that, we have a very exciting day out of us. I cannot wait to listen to all the speakers. And I really hope you enjoy all the sessions and learn a lot from them. I'll see you all at the end of the day today. Thank you.